Hello everybody, my name is Leah and I am the administrative assistant here with Africa Fire Mission. I just want to say welcome and thank you so much to everybody for coming today. Um, I'm really excited for today's training, so thank you so much um, for coming. We, re we really appreciate it. Um, I just want to ask and remind you all to stay muted throughout this training unless, of course, you have um, a question that you want to voice, um, then feel free to unmute or you can type it in the chat. I make sure to monitor that um, throughout the training. So if you have any questions or anything that you want to say, um, you can type it in the chat and I'll make sure that I voice that for you as well. Um, and I also just want to invite everybody to continue to share the link. Um, I know that we've had a lot of people join recently, which is really, really exciting. Um, so thank you for sharing that with your colleagues and community members. Um, so just continue to share that. And, you know, this is recorded and we post it on our YouTube channel. So um, share that link as well with colleagues or anyone interested, um, or you're more than welcome to go back and view it yourself, just if you want to refresh um, on what we're about to learn today about extrication. Um, and I also want to remind everybody um, about certificates that if you want a certificate, um, you have to stay for 75% of the training, which usually, if it's an hour-long training, that's about 45 minutes. Um, and I also ask if you don't want your name on your certificate to be your Zoom name, make sure that you um, email me or you can chat me um, on Zoom as well, and I will see that and make sure that you get the right name on your certificate. Um, but other than that, I want to pass it off to Jose, our fire safety advocate. He's going to give us a little word of encouragement today. Asante sana, Leah. Thank you very much, Leah. Truly appreciate. Welcome, Brad. Uh, so Brad, truly appreciate to have you on board. And everyone, happy Firefighters Day! Woo! I'm so excited to that we have a Firefighters Day. And uh, do you know what? Uh, if I was the Secretary General, <laughs> I could have given you the firefighter a holiday yeah so unfortunately i'm not <laughs> and with that i just and the encouragement of the day today i just wanted to uh to ask you a question do you know how the firefighters day came to be hmm, interesting yeah and i want to read this i have to read something to you yeah it actually came by from an incident. And it's unfortunate that uh, even when policies are being written for firefighters and also you find in NFPA, a certain uh, uh, instruction has been written, they surely come because of incidences. And I'm gonna read to you how the Firefighters Day uh, incident, why it came to be. On December 2nd, 1998, a, tra a tragic event took the Linton community in Australia and the world. Firefighters in Linton, Australia, a populated region in Victoria, were fighting a large bushfire and were called for mutual aid. The urgent mutual aid call brought the Geelong West Fire Brigade to the scene, not knowing the despair and tragedy that was in store. Gary, a guy got called a firefighter called Gary Ver Verdel Ditt, Chris Evans, Stuart Davidson, Jason Thomas, and Matthew Armstrong all loaded into, into the company's truck. They were part of a strike team and were being sent to help extinguish the flames. As the five headed into the nozzle zone, the wind suddenly switched direction, engulfing the truck in flames and killing all the five firefighters or the five fire members. This unfortunate incident is what inspired JJ Edmondson to bring about the international holiday called International Firefighters Day and to support the lives lost and dedicated the firefighters who risked their lives every day to save life and property. And with that, encouragement of the day, I would want us to take, because I actually have about three minutes, I want us in the next one minute to just pause for one minute and remember all the firefighters in the world, and also in particular in Kenya, 
and also in Africa, just to honor them, the fallen firefighters who went to save people's lives and they died. Just for a minute, we can bow down our heads or just pause and remember them. Thank you very much, everyone, for honoring all the firefighters who, who went before us and who are saving life and property. And even as we continue to save life and property, please stay safe out there. And please do not forget that this day was made to honor you and also the fallen firefighters. Back to you, Leah. Take us to the next stage. Thank you so much, Jose. I can't believe that I didn't say happy International Firefighters Day to everybody. I can't believe that I didn't say that. So thank you for saying that. Um, and I just want to say that I do appreciate all the work that everybody does um, and just how amazing you are, all are, um, and that you guys are all truly heroes. Um, and just to, like you said before, just how important it is to remember those who um, fought so courageously for the same cause. So thank you very much for that, Jose. Um, and then I just want to introduce Brad. He has trained with us before, and so he's back again. We're very grateful for you, Brad. Um, he's going to be teaching us about extrication today. So off to you, Brad. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Leah. Um, let me see if I can get up here. Can everybody see me? Yep. Okay. Um, happy International Firefighters Day to everybody. Um, we really appreciate you guys and gals. Um, appreciate you guys taking the time out to come on here and meet with us to learn. Uh, learning is very important. Um, appreciate the work that you guys do. Uh, we know that a lot of you all have um, a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges that, uh, that I don't have here. Um, and just appreciate the work that everybody does. So with that, I'm going to throw up my show here. See if it comes up. And let's get started. So um, for those of you that have never been on, um, been on with me, I retired for, as a, a captain for the Wichita, Kansas Fire Department seven years ago. I retired as the chief of my uh, small department, which is right outside of Wichita, uh, four years ago already. I still help them out as a firefighter. So anyway, uh, that's a little bit of background about myself. We're going to talk about um, size up and uh, prepping for extrication. Um, really going to hit on um, planning a lot, go through the objectives, uh, do a definition. Like I say, we're going to hit on pre planning a lot. Going to hit the CAN report, size up, and uh, give you some guidance on a, a couple of different uh, types of uh, operations, kind of broad broad types of operations. So let's go ahead and move on. So um, so let's talk about preparation. Um, obviously the name of the, uh, the show was Prepping and Size Up. So we'll hit preparation. And I wanna break preparation down into pre-planning 
and then our on-scene preparations as well. Uh, Pre-planning is a big part. Uh, you don't want to go out to an extrication and not be ready to, to go when you get there. There's a lot of pre-planning that can go into it to make yourselves ready to go when you uh, when you get out to uh, to your extrication scene, okay? And then uh, once you get there, there are some things that you want to do once you get out to uh, to get your uh, to get your extrication laid out and make it a successful extrication. So um, that's uh, that's what your uh, your preparations consist of. So your pre planning. Um, you'll notice that I have a toolbox there on the right. Okay, so your pre planning. That uh, that is uh, designed to develop a box of ideas, basically, and your ideas are are kind of like tools that you can use for extrication, and you can put all of those tools into that toolbox, and then as you need them, you can pull those out of that toolbox, and you can use those for uh, for extrication. Okay. Um, I told you that in the uh, objectives that we want to learn what extrication is. So extrication is the act of freeing someone or something from a tangled situation. So, uh, so anyway, so going back to extrication, um, we usually think of extrication um, in terms of uh, vehicles. So today I'm, I'm going to uh, expand our horizons, I guess, so to speak. Um, I'm going to make you guys, another, another way of putting it, I'm going to make you guys think outside the box or make you think bigger. And we're going to talk about extrication from other kinds of incidents as well. Okay. So um, not just vehicles, not just car wrecks, but um, I'm going to going to throw other incidents in there as well because like I said, in the in the definition, it's the act of freeing someone or something from a tangled situation. Okay. So let's go on and, and, and get into our, our pre-planning. Okay. So the first part of pre-planning is, is uh, looking at what kind of tools and equipment do we have. Okay. So if we look up here. Some of the things that we have here that I, I put up on the screen, we have a, a pry bar. We have a like a hydraulic bottle jack. We have a saw. We have the jaws of life for those of you that may have the jaws of life. Okay. Um, anything that we can use to, to pry, to lift with, to cut. Um, those are all tools that we can use in extrication, okay? Um, so when we do our pre-planning, uh, that's things that we all want to look at. Um, your available resources, okay? So when we pre-plan, know what you have and know what their capabilities are, okay? Keep that in the back of your mind when you, when you go to do an extrication. And that's just, that's not just those things that I have on the screen, but keep other things in mind that, that have those capabilities, okay? Not just those. I use those as examples, but any other things that you have that could do those, those type of things, all right? Those are just examples that I put on the screen there. Africans are very resourceful, so... I know that uh, you guys can come up with other things as well. Okay, pre-planning continued. Okay, training. That's the, ne that's the next thing I put up. Okay, you've picked out the things that you have, your available resources. Hello, Mr. Buns. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay. Yes. Um, what's hey, the topic uh, today we are talking about? I want to know the topic we are talking about today. 
Okay, let's uh, let's let's wait for questions until we're done. If we could keep your question, keep your question in mind, and we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so yes, so one of the the biggest resources we have are our people. Okay, so let's uh, let's train. Okay. Okay. You see these guys here? The reason I put this picture up, see what they're training with? Looks like they have a flathead axe and a Halligan tool. Okay, so they're using their available resources. So, and learn about new techniques. Learn about new things out there. You guys can go, obviously you're on Zoom. That means you have access to the internet. Um, those of you that have been fortunate enough to come to our symposium last year in November, uh, John, uh, John did a, a, a an awesome. Is that what it was John in? Trying to remember who else did it, but I know John led it. Um, did an awesome job. Well, it was John and John, both Johns did a, uh, an awesome job at, uh, at doing uh, an extrication training class. So um, things like that, you, there's always resources available where you can read and learn about new techniques. So, um, but, but read about new, new techniques you can use to, to do extrications, okay? Like I say, we're looking at this car, but other extrication techniques as well that we'll talk about, okay, as I, uh, as I go forward. Okay. If you don't have the tools that you need and you're pre-planning, look to other agencies. I have a picture here of uh, KAA. Some folks there I know from KAA in that picture. Um, but not just KAA, but um, other agencies that might have other tools and equipment that you don't have, okay? I just happened to, to find that picture and, and put those guys up in the picture. Um, those guys, I know the airports, they have, they have jaws. They have to have jaws to, uh, to be able to do extrications from aircraft. Um, there's a tow truck. Tow trucks can do an awesome job of lifting, okay? There's a utility company there. You'll have to have them there to, uh, to shut off the electricity sometimes, okay? Down here in the, the bottom right-hand corner, we have the police. Um, try to make the relationship with the police, okay? I know that can be a sore subject. Um, there again, it's a symposium last year in November. Um, we brought the police in for some of our training, and it was so awesome to see those guys work with us to, to secure. We used those in a training exercise to secure, help secure the scene, and that was so good to, to see everybody work together. So if you can make that relationship with the police, I know that can be hard sometimes, but try to do that. Get them involved, okay? But um, there again, during your pre-planning, try to do some training with, with these folks that you know um, could be your uh, resources that could be aiding you, okay? Okay, pre-planning. So you have to know your, uh, your community, the area you respond into. Know what's in that area. Okay, you know, for, for vehicle extrications, you're going to have the highways. Okay, you're going to have railways that uh, you could have car, car train accidents. You could have a, a, a train derailment that, that you might have to rescue somebody from. Your airports. 
Okay, you may be called upon if you're not working for, for the airport authority. I don't know if I have any airport firefighters. Um, you might have to do an, air, uh, an extrication from a downed aircraft. Your major intersections where you might have a, a, a car incident, vehicle incident. Manufacturing plants. You might have to free somebody from a machine. That's an extrication. Heavy construction, you have construction sites where you might have cave-ins, um, things of that sort, uh, buildings that might collapse on the construction sites. Farming, where you have farm equipment involved, um, entrapments in farm equipment, things of that sort. Weather-related incidents. Um, we had a weather-related incident in my uh, community last Friday. Um, I guess you guys might be familiar with the term twister, uh, tornado. We had a, a tornado incident about uh, 40 kilometers from us. It went um, around uh, metric about 25, 25 kilometers, uh, had winds of 270 kilometers, damaged around a thousand homes. Um, teams had to go in and do searches. Um, for the grace of God, we had a, a handful of people injured and no, no deaths. So we were blessed, but um, other weather related incidents, weather can cause buildings to collapse. Um, in Kenya, you've seen that, you know, time, time and again, where the weather, the rains have caused the buildings to collapse. Um, terrorism incidents, unfortunately, you've seen that in Kenya as well. Um, so, um, so those are things that you guys, you know, you can pre-plan for. Okay. Moving along. Okay. For these incidents, you need to learn how to use the incident command system. Um, I'm happy to see that people are learning how to use the incident command system. Um, keep learning how, keep working on that. Um, there are resources out there to, uh, to go out and, uh, and, and learn how to, to use it. Um, but keep working on it, keep training on it. You can do, uh, exercises where you can train on the incident command system work together with your uh, your agencies it, it, your neighboring agencies and and uh, train on that incident command system okay you can do what's called tabletop exercises you don't have to get everybody out there you can uh, the chiefs um, the station officers and sub officers can get out there and sit down at a tabletop. They can draw up a uh, an incident, and uh, they can role play just at, at the tabletop and uh, work on uh, incident command. Okay, let's move on to size up. Okay, this is. You're, uh, you're getting dispatched out to the incident, okay? So when you, uh, when you get dispatched out, that's when your size up is gonna start. Um, your size up is uh, basically your assessment of uh, what you have on that incident. Okay, like I say, your size up starts when you're dispatched. It starts with the information that you get when you take that phone call, when your dispatcher gives you, if you have dispatchers, um, when your dispatcher gives that to you or whoever takes that phone call, um, that's when that size up starts. Um, the weather, that's gonna, gonna play a role. Um, traffic conditions, um, you know, it's going to start number of vehicles. Um, there's 
hazardous materials or dangerous goods, if they tell you about that. Um, number of vehicles, if they tell you that, they, they might tell you the number of vehicles. Um, if they tell you that there's a collapsed building, that's all things to start thinking about. Um, you can start, you know, calling and, and getting additional resources started before you even, before you even, you know, when you leave the station, you can all, you can start calling for, for resources then. Okay, as part of that size up. Okay, and the size up, um, that's going to continue throughout that incident. All right. So as things change, you're going to continue to size up that incident. And that helps you to make the changes that you need as you uh, continue throughout, the, throughout that incident. Okay. Now, continuing with the size up, okay, there's a, there's a, a kind of a protocol that, that is real easy to remember as far as you're doing your size up. Um, it's called the CAN report. And that stands for conditions, actions, and needs, okay? And when you arrive on the scene, you're going to take a look at your conditions. All right. Your conditions are, what do I see? Okay, so you roll up on this car right here. All right. What do you see? You see a, a car that's um, pinched under this uh, bridge rail. Okay, that's your conditions. Okay. So other conditions that you might see, a two-vehicle accident with victims trapped. Let's say a four-story building collapsed with victims trapped under it. Or uh, the car versus the train with, uh, with hazardous materials, dangerous goods released. Okay, that's all, that's all things that you might see. Okay, and that's just examples. Okay, that's, it could be anything. That's your conditions, your C of your CAN report. Okay, so actions, your actions, A for, A for actions, okay? And that's what, what I'm going to do, okay? That's your initial actions you're going to take. Okay, so that might be starting your extrication, okay? If you need to do fire control, okay, that might be pulling that, pulling that branch line off and starting fire control, okay? You might have to secure the scene, keeping people out, um, accounting for the utilities, okay? Treating patients. If you have any, uh, have any um, EMTs with you, you might have to start treating patients. Those are all, like I said, there again, those are all just examples. Needs and the end in the can reporter needs. Okay. What do I need? Okay. If you roll up and you see that you have a major incident or uh, even if it's a smaller incident and you think you might need something right away, what do I need? Do you need another ambulance? couple ambulances, whatever, or you need an ambulance, okay? Do you need the police to, to, to keep bystanders out? Do you need some extrication tools that you don't have? Do you need more firefighters there? Do you need a hazardous materials team, okay? There again, that's, that's just examples. Okay. And there again, your size up, you, you continue to do the size up throughout the incident. And that's going to dictate what those needs are, depending on how that incident's going. Hold on just a second. My dog. 
can't decide if she wants in or out of the house. Okay, so you do that CAN report, and that's going to dictate what your on, on scene preparations are. And that's going to dictate those needs. Okay. And it's going to be based on the type of incident you have as well. Okay. So on all incidents of a uh, extrication nature, we want to secure the incident from outsiders. If there is a, if there's any kind of incident. And that's, that's any incident, really. We want to secure the incident from outsiders. We want, to, we want to keep people that don't belong there. there. And that's to protect them, and that's to protect you. Okay, we want to remove hazards. Um, your gas, if you have gas in there, like um, natural gas or, or LP, um, LP gas, um your electrical hazards remember i put that picture up of the having the electric company there um try to get them there as soon as you can to to cut the cut the power um there's hazardous materials obviously you want to get that contained as soon as you can um Securing any machinery, uh, especially if you have a, a machinery type incident. Um, if you can make sure that that machinery is safe so that the bystander does it, or so that the, the patients don't get hurt anymore, so you don't get hurt um, trying to do a rescue, uh, all things that you want to consider. So I'm going to cover. Um, a couple of different types, kind of general types of incidents. Um, vehicle extrication incidents, but into those we could also kind of blend um, farming, the rail, manufacturing, aircraft incidents all into this, kind of treat those the same way as far as the way we would handle those. Um, things that we want to do as far as our preparation. Again, we want to secure that vehicle when we do that. Um, as far as things we can do to secure them, we want to uh, make sure that they're not going to move. Um, we want to make sure that in vehicles, we want to make sure that the batteries are secure. That they can't arc and spark. Um, if there's any gasoline, diesel fuel, anything like that. We want to try to make sure that that, that is secured. All things to consider. Um, we want to try to get our tools out, get those to a central location if we can. We call it a tool staging area. That way, um, they're right there where we can we can have access to them as we as we do our extrication. During our extrication, we want to have a, a charged branch line or charged hose line so that uh, um, if there's any kind of spark, we're protected so that uh, we can immediately extinguish the fire, protect the firefighters, protect the uh, patients. Types of tools we want to consider having would be tools for cutting, prying, spreading to, to remove the metal, get it, around, get it away. Um, considerations when make, making our extrication plan. Okay, we wanna to try to plan our extrication so that we're removing the vehicle from around the victim, okay? We're removing that vehicle from around the victim. That's a consideration that we uh, make when we're uh, when we're rescuing that victim. Okay, that's going to do the least harm to that patient. Okay.
Okay. And as we go, always have a backup plan in mind. Right. So I showed a, I got a couple of pictures here. There again, I'm not showing them using available resources here. The top picture, they're using a jack and a piece of piece of wood here. And then in the bottom, they acquired a, a forklift to move people, to move vehicles. So there again, you guys are very resourceful. Uh, firefighters, all firefighters are. Canyons are very resourceful. Um, you know, as far as being able to, to come up with resources. Um, but like I said, just kind of keep those things in the back of your mind as far as the preparations you want to make in uh, readying yourself for the extrication itself. Okay. Pictures on the right. That's from our... Uh, that's our twister that we had last Friday night. That was about 40 kilometers away from my house. These would be considered collapse related incidents. You could include, uh, like I said, building collapses in with that type, weather, weather related incidents, your, your terrorism, anything where, uh, where you're going to have to move debris away, move them off of patients. So in a, in a building collapse, you're going to have to stop. You want to try to stop vehicle and rail traffic around your building collapse. Reason being is, is that, that the vehicle and rail traffic causes vibrations, can uh, cause more debris to fall in on, on your patients. So you want to try to, to, to keep that away from the patients if possible. Um, you want to have tools available for prying, lifting, cutting, um, shoring. If you don't know what shoring is, that's basically using uh, material to build um, You'd have like an, an L brace, maybe a piece of wood, metal, uh, something to, to hold debris off, um, keep debris from falling. Um, cribbing, that would be uh, pieces of wood to, to build up and hold debris up and off. Uh, cribbing you would use in extrication if you're doing a lift to hold hold something up, like hold your vehicle up from falling, hold debris up from falling, that would be cribbing. You can stack them, stack pieces of cribbing up to, uh, to hold, help hold um, your object up, your car, um, your material up. So that, that's what you would consider cribbing. Um, so anyway, if, if you have a collapse, you want to have heavy machinery available. Um, so many of you probably may have been around collapses. You'll see uh, excavators, cranes, things like that. Um, that's going to be your last resort if you can get victims out without that. But you may have to have heavy machines available. These are going to be uh, long-term incidents with uh, many patients, possibly. So you want to have EMS there with a full triage treatment and transport and ambulance staging areas for the incident commanders. That's something you want to think about because you may have a lot of patients. Okay, you want to, in these incidents, you're going to want to have a full ICS command structure because there's going to be a lot of, lot of different uh, people involved in this, you're going to have EMS, a lot of EMS involvement, a lot of fire, rescue, uh, police, um, 
that's going to be spread out over a long area. Like I said, this was this was around probably this particular incident right here was spread out over 25 kilometers. So we had to have a lot of resources just to, to search it. And, you know, just the EMS um, resources there. Plus it was over two different counties. So it was multi-jurisdictional. So that's why um, had to have that full command structure. Plus, um, because it was uh, a multi-day event, you have to have the planning, uh, the planning structure set up. You have to have the logistics. Um, you may have to have the finance. That's all part of the, the, the ICS structure. So that's why you have to have that full incident command structure set up. That's all part of the incident command system. Okay, moving on down. If you can get in and get the lightly trapped victims out of there first, uh, do that before you start uh, bringing in heavy machinery, doing that secondary search and, and digging deeper, okay? Before you bring the machines in, okay? So you have to have the staffing to work shifts, okay? There again, that's why you have to have that full ICS command structure. And you're going to have to have a backup plan because things will change in these. With this incident, we were blessed because we only had a handful of people, one serious injury, the rest were minor. Like two firefighters had minor injuries. So we were blessed. Okay, now I will, I am done. I will open the the floor up for questions. Tonight, how do you set up your ICS structure at your area? Oh, the ICS structure? Yeah, how do you set up set it up? Especially in the in the in the in the scene that I saw with the tornado. Uh, I just wanted to want to know where do you set up your ICS structure and most of your, most of your the work that you did in your time. Okay, now I I wasn't directly involved in the in the incident, um, but I listened to a little bit of it on the radio, and I know um, from from what I heard on the radio. Um, the way they set it up, they set it up into to branches. And they had um, rescue branches. They had a rescue branch, search and rescue branch, and they had a fire branch, and they had an EMS branch. And the, those those branches. We're all under the, the operations under fire or under it, it would be the operations. And uh under fire. No, it wouldn't be fire operations, it would be under it's operations. Got a, a, under operation disaster management. And then you would also at the operations level, you would also have planning set up. At that level. And then you would also have logistics set up at that level. Planning, planning is going to be uh, um, set up to, to plan for the, the next operational period. Um, and they're going to have, under planning, you would have. Um, Planning for resources and planning for the situation. They're going to look at what's going on with the incident, and that's called the situation status. Um, they're going to be looking at what's going on with the incident. They're going to be getting feedback from the, the people out in the field. And they're going to be 
working with the incident commander and operations to determine what the goals and objectives are for the next operational period. Okay. Then the Thank other. You. Oh, sorry. And then the, the rest of it will be logistics. Logistics is going to, to be, uh, they're going to be at the same level that, that planning and operations would be in. And their, their job is to, to uh, provide the resources that the incident needs. Uh, they, would, they would provide um, fuel for any of the, the apparatus. They're gonna provide um, food for um, the first responders. They're gonna provide medical care for the first responders. Uh, shelter, uh, like a, a base area for the first responders. Uh, any equipment that the first responders need, that's all under logistics. Um, then finance. Finance um, is going to pay the bills. They're going to be uh, if if they need if they need any money to to, to purchase any of those items, finance would be the the ones that would be uh, would be doing that. And they're on the they're on the same same level as um, the other. So, sir, can I? In the situation like that, uh, how do they shelter in the victims? Uh, who takes care oh. of the sheltering the victims? Oh, sheltering the victims? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, the community set up shelters at, um, I'm trying to think it was, uh, I think it was a local church, if I recall right. But they will usually coordinate that through um, the Red Cross. They will usually, you know, coordinate through um, emergency management and the Red Cross to get shelters set up. That's a good question. That's usually how that works. That's one of the functions that goes through emergency management and then the Red Cross um, or one of the other local local agencies. But that's that's usually uh, that's usually um, filtered through the emergency management, and then they'll they'll go on through uh, the Red Cross or another agency but then they they were they were shell they were sheltered at i believe it was one of the local churches because in our situation we've got the result that uh, uh that's not me but, yeah, that's a good question and that's always i know there's yeah. been there's been some some big fires in in some of the uh, the slum areas where the I think the, the the churches have have done that there, haven't they? Where they've allowed no. allowed. Uh, in our situation, we've got the disaster management that have uh, the municipality have got uh, resort that we shelter in people who who get in that situation like that. So That's good. When the disaster strikes, then we. The disaster management organize blankets, uh, beds, and everything for them. Take them to the resort. They organize rooms for them, and then food for them. So they shelter the the resort for about a month, two months, three months, and then from the when their places or houses are fixed, and then well done, then they bring them back home and give them some uh, investment for for to buy clothes. Uh, because some, sometimes most of the people will lose clothing and everything that they use. So just to hold them until they're gonna recover again. 
That's good. And that sounds like a very, very similar system to, to what we have. Um, our Red Cross will do the same thing. They'll give um, vouchers to the to the victims um, where they can they can get food and uh, they'll they'll temporary shelter in the in the shelter till they can get vouchers and uh, they can pay for a place to stay and and get and and food and clothing. So sounds like a very similar very similar uh, system. Very good. Good question. Very good question. All right, thank you. Thank it you. It looked like in the very beginning, um, Tyson had his hand raised. Um, Tyson, if you still have that question. Hello, Mr. What, 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 what I wanted yes. to ask uh, as a Yes, sir. Are you there, sir? Hey, hello. Tyson, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. What I wanted to ask had already been uh, handled. I wanted to ask of the notes, but uh, I've been directed to go to the site of the... To go to your site, I'll get those notes. So I think my question has been handled already. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Brad. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. This is Kalim Cyrus. What I wanted to know. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm here. Go ahead with your question. Okay. What I wanted to know is. Uh, is there any rules that we can use to form the incident command system during the emergency? Any, any rules? Am I clear? Um, there is a, a structure, and I think you guys have adopted um, a structure that's very similar to what we use here in the U.S. Um, it's put out, if you go into um, the National Fire Academy, you can try to, to get on to the National Fire Academy or just Google. Um, if you go on and Google um, National Fire Academy Incident Command System and take a look at their incident command system, that would probably give you some guidance as far as, as, far as, as um, the incident command system, if that would help you out. Um, that might be something, Leah, that might be something, I don't know if we have anything on the AFM site, that might be something that, that we could put up, yeah. um, that, that would be good, um, mm -hmm. some, some guidance on that. Um, I'm doing some quick Google searches right now just to see if I can find anything okay. good that I can post in our chat right now, but I'm just still looking through some stuff. Yeah, that would be, um, but as far as rules, I, I think from what I've seen, um, the, the, from, from being at the symposium, um, I think that's what, that's what they're using, um, is, is based on our incident command system that we use in the U S. So, um, is, is, is our system that, that we use here. So if, if you try looking into that, um, yeah, amazing. Thank you. Do we have any other questions that we can answer real quick, um, before we head into tea time with Jose? All right. Well, if not, thank you so much 
Brad for coming um, and presenting today. Um, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. It's always just such a blessing to have you um, with us and um, always really love your training. So thank you very much. Um, and I also wanna thank everyone for attending today um, and participating. That's really amazing. And I hope that you guys all stay for tea time and chit chat a little bit more um, with Jose and Brad, you are more than welcome. Hopefully you can stay as well. Um, if not, we understand that. But um, I just wanna remind everybody that I will be sending out certificates later today. Um, if you attended that 75% or 45 minutes of the training, um, if not, then hopefully next time um, I can send out a certificate for the 45 minutes for you. But um, I just want to invite everyone back next uh, next week. We're going to be having Michael Cole on and he's going to be talking about um, vehicle accidents and how to direct traffic during that time um, and just how to handle those situations in general. Um, so I just want to thank you all once again and remind everybody that this will be posted um, on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. Um, and I'm going to also be sending out an evaluation here in a little bit in the chat. Um, so if you would fill that out as well, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.